So first question we, we can ask is what are superfluids? So we know about the one manifestation of superfluidity, which is uh, a flow without any friction. So if you take a bucket of helium and you put it in a container, you can even go up and outside of the, of the container wall because it doesn't feel any friction between the, the container. So superfluidity was discovered in um, helium-4 and it was soon uh, explained in the, in the framework of, of a Bose-Einstein condensation. So because the, uh, um, helium-4 atoms are bosons, they can form a one macroscopic quantum state called Bose-Einstein condensate. And um, as such, a Bose-Einstein condensates are usually superfluid, although one is not equivalent to the other. And um, in, in case of super, uh, superfluid helium-4, the interactions are stronger than normally one would think of in the superfluid, so the picture is a little bit more complicated. But um, in general, we can, we can say that uh, because the uh, particles are occupying um, kind of macroscopic quantum state, they behave collectively. So if they meet an obstacle, they do not uh, scatter. Or uh, if you want to think energetically, is that um, any excitations outside of that microscopic object are energetically not possible because the relation between energy and momentum is modified. And it's modified in such a way that excitations are not possible. So that explains the fact that the superfluid flows uh, without resistance. Now, um, superfluids can be in the case of bosons or they can also be realized or exist in the case of fermions. So fermionic superfluidity is connected to, to superconductivity, um, which was discovered in the, in the case of, uh, of uh, electronic systems. However, uh, super, um, fermionic superfluidity in case of liquid helium, so helium-3, is is somewhat more exotic than, than the BCS superconductivity which was discovered in the case of electronic systems. So what happens is that the interaction between liquid helium uh, in the case of helium-3 atoms are quite complex and they lead to the pairing. So for them, I should mention that in the case of fermions, in, for them to go into the Bose condensed state, they first have to pair, they have to first form bosons. Two fermions will form a boson. Now, this pairing in the case of electrons is quite simple, it's symmetric, it's called S-wave in the case of the relative motion between two electrons, and um, whereas in case of helium-3 atoms, the pairing is uh, more complicated, it's called P-wave pairing, and it means that the internal um, orbital angular momentum is non-zero, you have some vector. If you, if you think about uh, two pairs, um, if, if you think about a pair, so if you think about two uh, helium-3 atoms, you'll have a vector associated with their angular momentum. At the same time, they have non-zero spin. So they will be in S equal one spin state, so you can associate another vector to their spin. So you have a, one vector for the, uh, for the angular momentum, one vector for their spin. Now when they condensed, what happens is that um, you have a breaking of more than one symmetry of the system. So a concept of the broken symmetry is, is a very close, is, 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 a, is a crucial um, concept in the theory of superfluids and, and, and for that matter superconductors. What it means is that if you have a system with, which is described by a certain Hamiltonian, it has a certain energy, um, it's invariant. Um, th there, are, there are some um, properties of the system which cannot be determined by that Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian is invariant under, for example, the direction of that spin or the direction of this uh, internal orbital momentum or, it's, or in the case of the condensate is invariant under the choice of the phase. So we know the condensate has a phase, has a, has a unique phase, but the Hamiltonian will not determine you what phase it has. So uh, the system spontaneously breaks that symmetry. Um, so in the case of the, of the superfluids, which uh, th there are simpler superfluids like helium-4 and more complicated superfluids such as helium-3, is that more than one symmetry is broken at the same time. So that was uh, due to uh, discovery uh, due to uh, Leggett, um, was that um, in case of the helium-3, um, not only the phase symmetry is broken, but also 
the uh, direction of the spin and direction of the internal angular momentum. And in it can be broken in different ways, so either you can imagine if this is an angular momentum and I break the symmetry, so it means that all my atoms are aligned with internal angular momentum exactly the same way, and the spin is aligned also in the same way. So this leads to um, a, a phase of the liquid helium. However, if I only fix the relative relation between uh, spin and internal angular momentum, um, like that, but in the only relative um, angle is fixed, but not the angle, each of the angles, then it leads to phase B um, of, the, of the superfluid. So the natural superfluids, such as helium-4 and helium-3, were kind of more or less understood within um, um, those frameworks. Um, however, superfluidity research doesn't stop at just liquid helium. And in particular, in, in, in the last uh, uh, few decades, um, ultra-cold atoms appeared as a new system to study superfluidity. And there, uh, you can create... Um, qu I mean, it, it, it's possible to create things which are not really normally appearing in nature. So, for example, one can mix statistics. So, instead of... In, in case of helium-4 or helium-3, it's either bosons or fermions. In case of cold atoms, you can mix. So you can put fermions and bosons together and you can create a superfluid state, which is at the same time a Bose-Einstein condensate of the, of the bosonic part and the BCS-like state of the fermionic part, for example. So that's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do, you can mix, um, you, can, you can imbalance the system. So you can put um, in, more particles of a certain spin of spin down, let's say, and less particle of spin down. So in the in the case of fermions, that's that's a quite um, a drastic thing to do because the Fermi surfaces will be mismatched. So you'll have a much smaller Fermi surface for one and for the other, and that leads to um, quite exotic pairings and and things which we are only just. It's, it's not well understood exactly what will happen in various uh, parameter regime. You can also mass imbalance, you can create a states which are going from BCS to BEC, so, um, um, so starting from fermions, the fermions can, um, by changing the interaction, for example, via external magnetic field using Feshbach resonances, you can induce um, a pairing, a strong pairing between um, fermionic atoms, which could undergo BCS type of superfluidity into um, more tightly bound pairs and molecules which could undergo Bose-Einstein condensation. So you have this superfluidity which, which can be in between the two, in between fermionic superfluidity and bosonic superfluidity. So this is um, a whole new system in which to explore superfluidity in contrast to, um, to, to, to helium. And, and a completely new system emerged even later than cold atoms, maybe in the last 10-15 years is that of photonic superfluids of um, exciton polaritons, uh, where again the, the whole plethora of superfluid behavior has been observed by now, such as frictionless flow, vortices, persistent currents, flow via obstacles, and so on. But then um, these superfluids are also quite different because, and this is this is to do with the fact that even if you create almost ideal mirrors for the photons to be trapped. They are never completely ideal. So the system is continuously decaying and you need to replenish the, the polaritons uh, from the other side. So the system is out of equilibrium, is driven dissipative. And um, if you looked naively at that system, you'd, you'd think that it violates so-called Landau criterion. So strictly speaking, the system should not be superfluid because it violates a very important criterion proposed by Landau, which decides whether systems are superfluid or not. But it actually turned out to be superfluid. And so we had to rethink and reformulate the theory of superfluidity in recent years in the context of this uh, new light matter superfluid. So, so the field of superfluidity, it's, although it started um, over a hundred years ago, it's, it's, it's a very active field of research in various experimental realizations and more exotic orders are created which are still connected with superfluidity and there is still quite a lot of open questions to, to be answered there.